All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, we're Team Wastewater, and uh, this is our presentation for Howland Calc um, Dairy Company on sustainability with uh, COD in mind. Um, I'm Ben. Uh, this is Melissa, Lucas, Yesenia, and Elizabeth. And uh, this is our project, yeah. Project overview. Uh, the uh, scope for a project is given that dairy plants um, produce high volumes of moderate um, organic. Um, what's your back one? Oh, is that? Yeah. No. <laughs> Sorry, That's I don't right. know why. It's like it, on here, it's like showing something else. Oh, um, produce moderate to high organic uh, components that contribute to overall levels of pollution associated with the water. Um, exceeding levels of uh, chemical oxygen demand, or COD, um, can incur costs for dairy processors in the form of surcharges and fines. Um, how and cow dairy uh, crate washing machine was the focus of our study um, as it pertained to the COD levels of um, outgoing wastewater coming from six different locations that we measured on the machine. Um, sustainable alternatives were researched uh, to address um, uh, per increased COD levels. Um, all right, the project objective uh, is to reduce chemical oxygen demand, or as I said, COD levels associated with how and cow's crate washing machine um, wastewater in order um, so that it can increase the sustainability of the plant and to uh, decrease possible surcharges brought by excess levels um, set forth by the pretreatment standards set by the city of Raleigh. Um, a little bit about understanding uh, chemical oxygen demand is that uh, COD measures the pollution potential for organic matter, uh, organic matter plus an oxidant uh, to CO2 and H2O. Um, testing is done uh, me by measuring the oxygen equivalent consumed by the oxygen organic matter in a sample during strong chemical oxidation. Uh, the units of measurement are milligrams per liter and it's tested at a very uh, a fixed temperature and a uh, very narrow pH range to uh, appropriately test for the COD. Uh, reagents are added, uh, added and during the setup of the analysis to drive the oxidation reaction to completion and also to remove any possible interferences. Um, the pretreatment standards and surcharges, well, we calculated our um, uh, standard for COD by multiplying the um, BOD standards for dairy plants by 1.5 and converting to units of milligrams per liter. Um, we got 95.86 to 449.34 uh, milligrams per liter as that uh, standard range. Um, our P the pH has no direct effect on COD. Um, over, over a long period of time, though, it, it can have an effect with temperature, um, but directly there's no um, effect. Um, and the phosphate le um, standard level is five milligrams per liter and the uh, ammonia level would be uh, 20 milligrams per liter. Um, surcharges uh, for the cost of uh, COD is uh, 25 cents to 60 cents um, per pound. And on average, uh, uh, plants will produce 16 pounds of COD per thousand ga gallons of water treatment. So it's anything ever to 16 pounds usually is, um, as I'm understanding it, is what is So for our experimental design, um, we used a lot of vials for this. We were taking samples fr directly from the case washing machine itself. Um, five samples were taken from six different sites on the machine itself. Uh, there's actually a, a, a figure on the next slide. I'll show you where all the sites are. So the samples were taken at the um, start of the processing day and the end of the processing shift um, across a number of processing days. And when we, when we actually received the samples themselves, uh, we took them over to the bio and ag engineering department and they actually ran the COD for us. Um, we chose to go with COD over BOD because of the tests they are able to perform there. Um, chemical oxygen demand is obviously given in milligrams per liter. Um, TAN, which is the uh, total, it's uh, yeah, it, has to do with nitrite. it was like it was like total total nitrites, and then the uh, orthophosphates here at the bottom are also milligrams per liter. Those are shows corrosiveness, other other aspects of COD. So those are measurements that um, they also had with the COD, but we were focusing mainly on the COD, so we're going to focus on that. Mainly. Yeah, they kind of associated. So this is the uh, current cleaner they're using that's actually hooked up to the case cleaning machine. Um, they actually meter it in at uh, certain times when the, the foam is low. It's actually a low foaming agent. Um, produced by Diversi, they are a green seal company. They, they look highly upon um, having green seal and eco logos. Uh, there's actually an initiative called GS34 is what I was reading about these companies getting together and actually um, trying to produce a more greener chemical where there's not going to be as many endocrine disruptors like bis bisphenol A, you guys know BPA was in like plastics and stuff like that. They were finding a lot of that in 
chemicals and shower curtains and all sorts of stuff that they didn't realize was going in as a cheaper product. Um, so that was pretty cool to read about their company. So this is the uh, sampling area, obviously the case machine in the middle. Um, starting over on the right hand side, we kind of had our areas uh, mixed up, but we did get um, a set kind of a pathway. So you start here on the first first drain, which is actually the drain on the right hand side. That's actually the side where the cleaning hasn't taken place. Um, most of the water that hasn't touched the crates is going to be flowing into there, um, high concentration. And you have two and three are actually two different reservoirs. If you ever take a look at the, um, the case machine, there's two reservoirs. One where the uh, actual mixing is occurring, and then there's another one where it's filling rinse water, or the water is actually filling up. Um, as you move up, I'll just go ahead and say um, four is at the end where the line is actually draining off of the, um, the, uh, the belt itself. Um, six going up is where the, where, what I said, the, uh, the rinse water or fill water. Um, and then five is over on the other side of the drain where the cases are actually coming off. You're seeing a lot of drainage right there. And just from looking at the water, you can tell that it's foam. Um, it does contain a lot of sanitizer cleaner. So as far as measurements go, um, like he had said, we initially were looking at VOD, but we actually switched to COD because of the capabilities of NC State to um, measure COD. And it's a shorter test, but it still took a little while to get our samples run through and um, get some data back. And right here, what we did was, um, this is a variation of COD within the production startup. And we looked at one processing day. We actually didn't get the chance or have the time to do multiple days quite yet. And it's something that we're looking forward to maybe in the future. But um, this is for one processing day that we're going to be looking at the data. And this is a startup. So it's variation between sample locations. And as you can see, the average of the means for sample location one, which was that right drain that you had seen over here, is the highest. Um, and then six is where the standard, just like the water coming out of the pipes, just your average water um, from the water system, is the lowest COD. So that would be what we hypothesized in the beginning was that that was going to be associated with the lower um, levels. And then we have this value just tells us that the probability that this is happening from random occurrence is very, very low. It's less than 0 .0001. So this is a means grouping, and this just shows that um, which sampling sites are very similar in COD, COD levels to one another. And we found that um, two and three are very similar, and then three and four are similar to one another. This also shows you know, your mean averages for COD. Um, for one, obviously, for the start of it was about 317 um, milligrams per liter, and for location six, is about 8.6, which is actually very low compared to the standard, which is like the minimum standard is about 90 or so. So here we have final production hour, and it's a little bit lower. You can see for um, location one, it's around 250, and um, actually for location six, which was the least concentrated, um, it did raise a little bit. So we can't really make any definitive um, assumptions about quite yet about the processing startup and finalization because um, we haven't done multiple days yet, but that was something that we were looking at because we wanted to know if the concentration of the cleaner was um, changing the COD levels from the start to the end of the day because they're adding you know, maybe less cleaner at the end of the day since they're slowing down production and um, there's also not as much maybe residue on the crates from the organic matter that they would be processing too there's less material. So this is another means grouping, and this one actually says that one, two, and three were similar, and that three and four locations were um, similar too. And as you can see, six actually is much higher, about three times as high as the um, last, which I'm not really sure. That might have just been like a sample um, problem varied, with yeah. some sort of contamination, because I just don't think that the water could have varied that much, just the pure water from the All right, so uh, this is a prior diagram showing the average COD levels in all six locations. And um, from this diagram, you can see that uh, it was actually uh, 
the location too that had the most COD uh, concentration in milligrams per liters. Um, and as Melissa mentioned before, uh, location one did have the highest COD levels at the beginning and end of the production, but um, it was in between the uh, hours of seven, eight, and nine that location two had the most COD levels. So that's why location two is showing us a very high concentration here. Um, so analysis of results. Uh, just to kind of summarize, uh, the maximum COD levels uh, were in location one at the start and end of production, and then the lowest was in location six. Um, and then two and three, and three and four are the most similar. And then at the end of the production, one, two, three, and three or four are the most similar. And then this is just a variation between the um, start of the final production hours in locations one and six. It's just 80 milligrams per liters and then 20.2 milligrams per liters. And once again, like we can't, we need to do more sampling um, across days in order to get more information about this because this doesn't tell us exactly too much because that difference um, between the first, the final, and the end with the 80 milligrams, that was saying that it was higher at the initial startup and then lower at the end, whereas with location six, it was actually higher COD levels at the end, um, which we weren't sure what to. We could attribute it, but when you saw that the way that the, uh, the solvent cleaner was added, it was actually metered into the system as as um, the concentration. I get it was kind of a employee decision, as we saw. It would just go over and just the box, press the button, it would meter more in. So we maybe think there's variation there. If you keep it a constant rate through the day, you might see the numbers come closer together. So for improvements, um, just some training suggestions that may already be going on. Um, cleaning crates immediately after they aren't being used, so that way any potential milk, whatever residue on the crates may come off easier if it doesn't have time to sit on the crate. And monitoring levels of cleanser, um, we, Lucas just sort of talked about this, um, having a more consistent flow of cleanse, cleanser perhaps, you know, more regularly on you know particular amount of set of minutes every time rather than just doing it um, and so as far as a new cleanser goes we also sort of talked about this earlier um, diversity is an eco-friendly um, cleanser according to the seller you no know, endocrine disruptor stuff like that um, hydrogen peroxide could be added some research we did um, as a second line into the cleaning solution in order to oxidize the organic components in the cleanser in order to lower the COD, and we'd have to do some more research um, in order to know exactly where the hydrogen peroxide needs to be added in the process. Um, an alternative and to the case washing machine, an expensive alternative, is the ultrasonic cl cleaning. Um, it is a great cl cleanser. Uh, it, it can get into grooves and cracks where most cannot but it is um, an expensive alternative. The actual piece of equipment is um, some benefits, however, it would cut your cleaning time, you would have to use less cleanser and maybe um, a softer cleanser. Um, some research we did said it was effective process for removing cheese from cheese molds, which you know would be similar to something like a milk dairy product. Um, and also against the removal of persistent growth of Listeria monocytogenes, and that kind of goes into just like it's a food grade, you know, it would be good to use for a food grade facility. And then another alternative um, would be corrugated boxes. Um, basically, this would just be sort of a one-time use sort of thing that can be reused, but obviously they can't be cleaned, so it would be minimal reuse, um, but the larger boxes are only about 75 cent to $1.50 per box, and um, some of them use uh, a minimum of 30% recycled content, so. Okay, so some of the limitations of this study, obviously we weren't able to do all the sampling that we wanted to, um, just given the time period that we were given. So. Um, we would say that we wanted to, oh, some points were high for the crate washing machine, um, and they didn't exceed the limits of COD, so we weren't quite there, but cumulatively, we were kind of thinking about if you add all those areas up, if that would matter 
um, and still contributes to sustainability. Um, we might not be talking cost-wise quite so in the crate washing area, but this study could be applied to the processing side of things. And you had the highest level we had for the crate washing was 430 milligrams per liter, but um, that's only about, what, 19 milligrams per liter below the standard. And I'm sure in the processing side, they're much higher because they're using the CIP systems and um, all the other organics coming from the vats that are being um, put down the drain and everything. So that's going to be useful for there. Um, and then, like I said, we're going to be taking, or what needs to be done in the future is take samples across various days and um, look more within, as Yusania did with um, looking within the processing hour to seeing um, if there's variation within it um, and using statistical analysis for this. So we just wanted to say thank you to Dr. Stevenson, Gary and Carl, Dr. Carawan, who's not with us today, but he was okay. awesome, and um, Randy and the Dairy Crew and the Sustainability Office for coming out and listening to our project. I have one. Um, first off, we appreciate the work you've done. It, it, even you know all the sampling you did kind of points out that uh, we've always kind of known that process is a little bit out of control. But especially some of the things pointing out is this kind of operator interface and the variability you're doing now. The, uh, obviously what we're concerned about in the sewers was, was the effluent going down those two drains. And one of them was, was on the high side, right? The, the, and then the other one was low. But the volumes in the lower one was substantially higher. So poundage delivered probably could potentially even exceed what's going down on the, the higher concentration side, right? So, so it would be, important for us to, to well, the best thing to do is correct it, right? Stop stop all that up while I'm going down the drain, which is also going to reduce the amount of soap that's got to go into the system, maintain the concentration. So, and I will say one thing, we're working with a company, and this has happened since you were doing the process, that, that, that we've got a possibility of, um, I don't know if you've heard of electrolyzed water, but it's a very minute amount of salt put in standard water, and it high current creates an electro electrolysis and creates an acidic component of hydrochloric acid, and then more of a sodium uh, or a, uh, sodium hydroxide other component, but very volatile. It's a, it will disassociate very quickly back into water salt, but the cleanability and the sanitation of those two systems uh, are almost as effective as the chemical, which essentially removes a lot of... The I've read about that process before. They use it on needles and stuff. I actually read about tattoo needles. They actually use that process to, to clean the tattoo needles that you're going to be touching people's skin with, and they have to stay sealed up pretty well. They have to be cleaned very well before they go into their packaging, so. They didn't use, they didn't use that on, on mine. <laughs> <laughs> I, mine was rusty. <laughs> I, I, got, I got some questions. <clears throat> all right, so if I look at your two key pairings on your statistics, all the diameters are the same size on your right hand. Isn't that a reflection of the variability? And why is all the variability the same at every single location? The diameter on the circles on the right, Oh, these? And, yeah. Shouldn't, shouldn't the diameter of those circles represent the variability? Um, okay. I did this graph yesterday. These are just showing, I think, yeah, these, well, these would be showing the variability. Yeah, I, I, think the that, I think that they should be larger when the dots are spread out, I, I think. I, I agree Correct me with if you. I'm wrong. I but think that it's showing, like, the, the average would be the center, obviously. Yeah. I, I think that the circles probably should be bigger. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly like why. When okay. we did this through the Asana, they mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I grouped it by means. I think, this is what they gave us. I think that'll probably just take some look and make sure I'm right about that. Yeah. So why why are why are you even 
treating these crates? What's the purpose? Food safety. Food safety, ultimately, right? Yeah. Food safety. Are you going for cleaning or ster sterility in these crates? Just cleaning. Cleaning. Yeah. Right? So if you're just going for cleaning, is COD or BOD a better measurement? What do you think? Well, from what we heard from Dr. Carawan, BOD is actually a very time-consuming process to, to measure it. It, it was developed, uh, he said, hundred year, hundreds of years ago, hundred years ago, I think is what he used. But he said it takes five days just to run one test. And for sustainability, he said just when COD came along, it was just so much easier to, to so track your... So BOD gives you an indication of potential for biological or microbial growth, mm -hmm. which could lead to food safety. But if you're just looking to clean, mm -hmm. may, maybe that's a good defense for why COD was rapid, mm -hmm. trying to clean. Maybe that's a, a good answer, a good argument for selecting COD. Mm -hmm. um, the last question that I have for you is, you had six locations, some upstream, some downstream, and I think you mentioned this with your Pareto diagram. It looked like location two was what you had indicated as, mm -hmm. as the selection. Yes, if you were to address location two, how does that impact downstream sampling? Like if you co correct the issues at location two, does it, will it automatically lower everything downstream? Location two is actually where all, this is funny because this is where like you hypothesize where most of the, yeah. um, it would be, but when we were showing, we were so focused, I guess, on another drawback of what we did with our data, was that um, we were focused on the beginning and the ends, just like the fluctuations, and we didn't look so much in between. But um, it did show that two was the highest, and that would be because most of the cleaner is yeah. definitely in there, because that's where it's most sudsy, and like you can, it's visual. And you could also, you could also, I guess, make an argument for if it's that's the reservoir if you fix some of the leaks underneath the machine right then you would automatically decrease Increase downstream because exactly. you would save the the reservoir it would keep longer you know yeah. like you, would, you would have chemicals in there for uh, a, a longer amount of time you wouldn't have to keep metering more in and then just letting it drain back to the floor and you you, you could actually have an increase in two if the system was more functional than right. it is, that are better repair. So you can actually increase two and potentially still, at least if you're looking at the pounds per hour or whatever goes down mm -hmm. the drain, that can be reduced and uh, uh, yeah. and maybe even be uh, diluted some even in five. So one location, one and five, are the, 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 the escape. That's, that's the, the escape, yeah. That's, the, that's the point where it actually makes it to the the drain and then that goes up to the and we, we were looking at pre-treatment numbers we, we kind of came into this looking at a lot of we thought it was going straight into the you know we were coming in looking at it like it's going straight to the stream but it actually goes to a pre-treatment facility and we wanted to look at pre-treatment standard numbers that this facility seems to be not not close to them but it's you know they're approaching so yeah so we've come a long way from <laughs> three weeks ago yeah we had a whole our focus turn around switched multiple times so we kind of I feel like if given more time like we could definitely like get free grasp on this and it'd be a lot more clear. Did did you investigate the possibility of uh, a, a real time monitoring of the amount of cleaner that's going in or the uh, the density of whatever that cleaner is and, and whether or not it can be automatically added to the machine rather than manually? I, I didn't, uh, we didn't look more into the, you're maybe getting into like the metering system itself if, right. the, if it's appropriate for that. Um, and that's further, we should probably look further into that. Yeah, that would be awesome to do because then you wouldn't have to even bother with the employees having to go and check it day in day out that's human error and that, I mean, they could be busy with something else and forget to do it and an hour goes by and it's just straight water. It's very like diluted with the um, solvent cleaner. It's cleaning these crates and it's not doing its yeah, great job, I, so. I think in this process, just because it's so continuous that you couldn't go to like a tablet form of, of a, 
Well, I know in the CIP system we have sort of this real-time conductivity monitoring mm -hmm. of uh, of the water, and so I wondered if it would be possible to monitor that and then to feed a system that would tell um, the cleaner when to be added uh, on an automatic idea. pump yeah. or something mm -hmm. like that. I Maybe think that focus that's on pH or an awesome idea. Um, as long as the crates don't come back with tequila salt or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that could be a problem. <laughs> yeah, you never know what might come back, but that's that's the better. Maybe it's too automated. Not, not <laughs> Tickly jobs. But you made a statement just a second ago. I know we're about out of time, but uh, I'm talking about flipping multiple times just in the last few weeks. Doing this product, did it has it made you feel like you'd be more comfortable if you went into a production environment in your job in the future? Definitely. Um, yeah, to look at areas of concern. A little less intimidating, you know, because you don't always know what you're looking at until you know, looking at everything and you know, you have to research a couple of things and see what's causing like the greatest problems are like the low hanging fruit that Dr. Stevenson talks about. I mean, it's definitely one of those things that we started off looking at what the VOD and the other side of the plant, and we came to the, cr the crate washing machine. So it's been something that we've had to narrow our actual focus onto something and like really focus on that one thing. Even with the CSD, you're looking at pH and the phosphate levels, and you're getting really lost in those. And so we could have gotten really lost in this, but we tied it down to COD finally. Yeah. Um, yeah, we yeah. definitely took a big bite out of this whole wastewater thing. And then I think with the help of a lot of different sources and Dr. Carawan and Dr. Stevenson, we, we, we really kind of narrowed it down to case washing machine, COD, pretreatment standards, and just went from there and just kept specializing and specializing in what we tried to apply our research to. So. So on that note, I'm super excited to see where everyone ends up a year from now as they make us proud here at NC State. And let's rewind to the beginning of the semester where we were talking about quality management principles, that means 14 points, the cost of quality. And so my question is, let's say you do get your first job as shift supervisor, or maybe you have Randy's job. He's the supervisor downstairs working right now. How would you go about building a culture of quality so that all the operators down there are super concerned about making this better? Uh, I would say just by using the domain process and like setting up initial processes that we came in there, we were managing that process already ongoing, see what measures they were using, um, and then you know see what measures they to monitor and inspect, and then you know use the knowledge that we gain from quality control to refine those measures to either make them less costly. Um, or make them more complex depending on if there was an issue in, the, in whatever area of the product in the plant. Um, so yeah, just say that, just sort of just you know, we wanted to further enhance it or to draw back uh, inspections that were that not needed. What's the incentive for the employees to do that? I would well, you have to make yeah. them care about their job. And I, I mean, as a supervisor, you have to be, I guess, caring towards them, you know, or you have to be generous and get to know them so that they. You know, care about what they're doing. You can use control charts as well to you know better post the show so to show the employees that yes. they're within their proper um, you know, specifications and you know sort so they know what's right and what's wrong to you know, incentivize the performance. Three incentives and then show them the performance. Yes. Graphically show them. That's why a lot of those charts and things are, are critical to, to outline where, where those improvements begin. Absolutely. So Let's keep on time and give this team one round of applause.